Hi, everybody. I'm Pam Suplo. It's nice to see some new faces and some faces that I already know. Um, I own a HR consulting firm called PS Squared Advisors. We work with organizations of all sizes and shapes around their employee experience and their talent management strategy, a lot of team effectiveness, culture work, um, and uh, as I said, employee experience work. So this topic is really close to my heart for a number of reasons. Um, I've also worked in uh, large global organizations uh, for much of my career and so I have a lot of experience working um, on remote teams, on virtually dispersed teams, uh, and on hybrid teams, and obviously have worked with my clients over the last 18 months or two years, as I'm sure many of you have, on sort of how did they think about their changing work environment as a result of the pandemic. So I'm excited to partner with Morris today to sort of share our observations, what we're seeing, and what we're experiencing personally ourselves, um, and to hear from all of you what, what you're facing and, and how you and your organizations are coping with it. So again, nice to be with all of you this morning. Super, thank you, <clears throat> Pam. Morris Yankel, HR Computes. Uh, the name says it all, but nobody ever gets it. It's <laughs> human resources technology. It's what we do. Been doing it for 30 you know, some of the, some years. And um, I know a lot of folks. Great to see Susan. Great to see you, Matt. Welcome. Um, haven't seen Matt in a long time. That's really cool. Fred, Mark, Newell. I love it. Linda, um, everybody else, uh, welcome. And yeah, a conversation here. Um, I'm currently on a remote team with a client that is in 10 different countries. So bring some of that to the table. There's some technology pieces and some things uh, that I've seen folks use. And then we've got Pam from a culture expert or, or just from uh, an engagement and workflow. You know, how do you get people to work together conversation? So I'm looking really forward to it. All right, so we're going to get started. All right. Um, I think the first question I'm going to ask Pam, unless you want to just cut, uh, just start it off. No, okay. Go ahead. Ask away. All right. So one of the questions that we've all had when it talks about remote is, does remote work increase or decrease productivity? Oh, Amy, that's such a good question. Um, I think it's both. Um, and so, and I think there's a number of sort of environmental factors about the organization that you work in, um, how used to how used to working in a remote or a hybrid or a virtual kind of environment was the organization prior to COVID, and or, and or how fast was that pivot because of COVID? So I think that plays a pretty big factor. I think what the research is showing, and um, the CEO of Microsoft actually just termed this, I just read an article recently, which I think, Amy, you might have sent out to everybody in advance. It's called the hybrid paradox. And so what the research is showing is that individual productivity is actually going up because people have more flexibility to manage their own days. There's not as many distractions, people walking by your desk. There's not as many coffee corner conversations taking place. So daily, an individual productivity is going up. In a, from a productivity perspective at an organizational perspective or in an enterprise perspective where you're looking at productivity from an innovation, creativity, challenging the status quo, that type of thing, that kind of productivity is actually going down because they're, they require two different things. And one, if I'm doing individual work, being at home, being remote works perfect if it, my job or the work that I'm doing requires me to be very collaborative with other people, um, that kind of productivity is going down. So I think it's, it's, it's both um, mm -hmm. is what the research is showing right now. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of contextual factors about the organization and about the level of tools and support that the organization has as resources to help people work remote is also having a pretty significant impact on that productivity question. Thank you. Morris. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, so it's interesting. Um, human resources a lot of times dives into, you know, what jobs do people have? What's their job code? What band are they in? You know, what department are they in? What organization structure are they in? And all of those things definitely impact is remote or, you know, in person better or worse. Uh, and so I think that, as Pam said, it depends on what people are really What's their job? What's the tasks? What are the things they need to get accomplished? Um, I think that definitely weighs in here on whether or not they're more productive or not. And then I think the second thing is, from a technology perspective, is if people are operating in the cloud, for the most part, 
you know, again, depending on their job, how much of their job is on a computer. So are we talking about a customer service crew, you know, that are answering phones and doing that kind of work? Or are we talking about accountants, maybe, who are in Excel? Um, you know, it depends on what tools are those folks using. And what some of the literature shows is that if, and there aren't that many of them, although a lot of the big organizations still use it, on-premise type systems generally operate better at a better speed when you are on premise, when you have access to, uh, you know, those kinds of networks. When you're remote, whether it's, you know, a virtual private network, VPN, or just through the web, and you're trying to get to those applications, it can degrade the speed. So some of the numbers I've seen are, you know, maybe 20 minutes a day. So you look at it, you go, well, 20 minutes a day, that's like a good long coffee break. But on the other hand, if it's slowing you down when your hand's on the keyboard and you're trying to get something done because of that technology issue, that can be, a, a, you know, bring productivity down. And I'm not getting away from the collaboration point that you're making, Pam, but one other piece is we need to also consider network speed, um, you know, internet connections. Mm -hmm. So... I think the assumption from a business is well, everybody's got Comcast and, you know, they're all moving along at whatever billion mega, mega schmoogy bits, whatever we want to call them. And uh, it's just not true. So understanding what are the resources of the employees who are coming in and who are supposed to be in the Zoom call, but their screen is, you know, flickering or you can't hear them. Uh, those kinds of things also will affect productivity. So um, I think a couple of those, wow, there's two Zoe's on my screen. Yes. And, um, I'm going to say, speaking of technology issues, <laughs> it, you know, it's one of those that, that yeah, good. And I think a lot of us talk about international. And so with that international part of it is, you know, do the other people, you mentioned more so about the internet speed. How many people have been dealing with international as well, where they may not have the same uh, capabilities as we have? Yeah. I think one other stat that I saw in doing a little bit of research for this conversation is that when people work remotely, they tend to work according to their own schedule. So I was on a call yesterday and we were coming up on uh, a four o'clock hour and a couple people on the call said, eh, you know, I really got to go because I have to pick up my kids or this is when my kids come home. Um, so the, the room is going to get noisy or you'll hear the dog bark or whatever. So I think that's the other piece. And what the, the literature shows is that when people are working from home, they tend to spread the day out. So maybe they start at 6 and they end at 10. When they're in the office, it's more I'm commuting to the office and I get there. Maybe it's at 6 and I leave at 3, you know, or whatever, 8 to 6. Um, but that is the, the time when I generally work. What you see when folks are working from home is that they're working intensely at 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. So, you know, it's just, again, and I think that goes to Pam's point. If you need to get together and collaborate on something, that's going to be tough to do at 10 o'clock at night. Although when we get to the international question, then time clock, you know, time zones, et cetera, will come into it. Morris, I think you raised some really interesting points, though, one that I kind of want to underscore, particularly for those of us on the phone mm -hmm. that um, that work with uh, either work within a corporation or work with corporations. One of the things that I've seen organizations get really intentional about is helping to ensure that their employees have the right tools at home in order to be productive productive. So as an example, I have a client that at the very beginning of the pandemic sent out a survey basically asking people about what their bandwidth was um, and what their network capabilities were, and then provided a stipend every month so that people could upgrade if they needed to. They also gave um, employees stipends to sort of outfit their home offices, whether that was with a new desk chair or with the standing desk, or if it was just for stationary supplies or a printer. The things that I have at my disposal when I'm in the office that I might not have had in a home office. I think organizations at the beginning and continue to try and think about if people are going to be at home for longer or in this hybrid environment for forever, what do people need to be productive at home from the basics? 
right? So a printer, if I need to print something out, mm -hmm. and then how do you help to support employees in getting that? Um, and so I think, you know, HR teams, finance teams, and IT teams have probably had to collaborate more over the last 18 months than they've ever had to collaborate before in order just to get employees to be able to do the core basics of their job, particularly for those people who were always working in an office and never really had to think about working from home. I think, uh, you know, I would like to ask um, in the crowd, Matt um, Tinney is, uh, like you said, on the technology side, Matt, how do you do this kind of question? Because your folks are, they need high-speed connections. Do you reach out to them or do you support them, you know, financially or whatever to, to help them get that if they're going to be remote? And then especially if they're going to be remote, well, maybe it's brand new, but into another country. Uh, so this is a big problem, but, you know, honestly, we, uh, we've always been remote right. since I started. So yep. we've never, you know, focused on on-site because really and truly our consultants need to travel anyway. So they go on-site and they work from home, you know, when they're not on-site, you know. So that model's always been there. We do provide the uh, infrastructure though, right? We're 100% cloud. We provide the assets to our consultants, the, the laptops. You know, we provide, um, you know, the security policies, uh, security awareness training to work from home because that's a big problem too, right? You got your impersonal network. Well, guess what? If your wireless is not secure, guess what? Neither is your machine. So there's a lot of issues with that. So really thinking about that from um, a support perspective, do you have the internal managed services support for your workforce to open tickets up and get the support they need? Because that that was a big um, issue during COVID that we found. So I would just be looking at what's your capabilities to support a workforce um, when there's issues that come up and absolutely providing stipends to support the upgrade to bandwidth to um, what Pam was saying. I think. That's an important part, but I really think engaging the technology team to create a strategy to support that proactively and the surveys is, is exactly one of the most important things. Uh, yes, may, may I speak to that too? Um, because uh, I, I used to be CIO in our company uh, and I'm no longer doing that. Uh, our company does not offer a stipend or any kind of support for broadband access. Uh, I, me personally, because I'm always online, I have two high speed lines that I mix into a router in my own house, but some of my folks just have, you know, a Comcast modem or something like that, that they haven't upgraded in years. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people connect via wireless when they do online collaboration. I find that a wireline connection is far better. Uh, so the company is pretty good with printers and, and chairs and things like that. Although the stipends never come out to anywhere near what you spend, but there's zero zero on, on internet support. And we closed 30 offices last year in the United States alone. Uh, so uh, they were just having trouble getting the VPN rolled out to everybody. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's an evolving problem. The, the other thing is, is I'm in telecom, uh, that's the research I do. So we, um, we actually did a work from home study last year and we do B2B work and we score the, the Dun & Bradstreet file with uh, information concerning that. Uh, and what we found is that this is not a, a singular problem, that a lot of, a lot of companies are having problems with the, the, uh, the front end connection, the, the user connection to the corporate network, uh, such that you know, the whole industry is trying to rethink. So right now, our company has basically outsourced 30% of its internet function to individuals uh, who are using residential connections. Uh, and that's a big deal for the telecoms. They they need to understand how that shift has occurred, and they need to be in front of that, where they're gonna they're gonna have trouble. That's very good point. Thank you, John. And Sam switched it over to another question. Sam, do you want to uh, ask your question here? Get you. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Amy. Um, the uh, and I put this in the chat box, <clears throat> but in my firm, uh, and I've been around, uh, we've been around 28 years, I've always uh, recruited and hired the recent grads that th those have been maybe half my team. Um, and you're talking to people who are 22 years old, you're hiring people who you can afford, you expect to grow them. And as I've always told them, you know, my job is to grow you, your job is to bust your butt for me, 
in a year, two years, three years, we're going to get you to the point where you're ready for your next job where I can't afford you and I'm going to help you get there. Um, and that's been a great bargain in a, in a recruiting because in our work, I'm, I'm a leader in our field. So, uh, but the real challenge at last fall, I hired two recent grads, one from Penn State, one from Delaware. And you might see these, I'll say kids, since many of us have got graying hair, you might see these kids once a month. I, you know, I saw one of them yesterday and it was the first time I'd seen him in, in about a month. And I might talk to him once or twice a week. So it's, it's a, and, and as a small team, we, we're not heavy in management structure. We're expanding. So we're just now rolling out KPIs uh, and more metrics. We're not, uh, you know, as we've acquired a company and we're building on that. So the real challenge is how do we, maximize the productivity of young people who don't know what they don't know? Yeah, it's a really good question, Sam. I, I have a lot of empathy for people who onboarded to new organizations during the pandemic because it feels really different uh, than it did to onboard pre-pandemic. And I think all the same things that you do when somebody's in person are possible to do in this new working model. People just need to be way more intentional about it. And so, um, you know, using technology like a Slack or a Teams to check in with somebody every day to have a regular cadence in the same way that you mentioned that, you know, somebody might pop into your office once a day or twice a day when you were in person, um, scheduling office hours. So people, it's locked on your calendar. People still have the flexibility to do that if they need it. Um, and then, um, you know, depending upon the size of your organization, We've worked with clients and I've seen clients do some amazing things about giving people new hires a flavor for what the company is via creating videos, getting their CEOs and their executive team more involved in welcoming people um, to the organization, whether that's through a welcome letter that you get in the mail a few days before you start or in, included in sort of your welcome box that has your IT equipment in it. Um, so trying to figure out ways to make that personal connection for people we're just joining your organization, even if you're never going to see them face to face, or it will be a while before you see them in person face to face. Um, you know, using Zoom or other technology like Zoom um, to make sure that when you're having weekly meetings or regular meetings with people that you can see them, because obviously a lot gets lost through not seeing, not having the um, the nonverbals and the and the cues. And then I think the way. Um, the way people start to think about expectations, particularly as you're onboarding new people and having some grace in the fact that in, in pre-pandemic times, um, perhaps you would think that it would take 30, 60, 90 days to get somebody onboarding, onboarded. It's just gonna take people a little bit longer to get onboarded because there's not that immediacy of, I can just swing by somebody's desk and ask them the question. I also think, again, depending upon the size of the organization, introducing something more formal around having a buddy um, so that the new hire has somebody who's sort of assigned to them who can help them through those first few weeks of getting acclimated to how does the technology in this company work? Because now there's so many different versions, whether <laughs> it's Box or Box or, um, or Google Drive or a Share Drive. Like there's so many different ways that you can collaborate in the cloud that maybe the past organization I worked for used a different system and I don't even understand the language that you're using. Um, so making sure that you're not making any assumptions also, I think about what people know or don't know based on their past experience. And in your case, based on the fact that most of these people are recent grads. Um, and so I think everything is possible to do and get the same outcomes. You just need to be much more intentional about actually doing it, I think, than you probably needed to be in the past. Sam, I went like through this. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Amy. Um, I went through this recently by hiring a full-time person, and I want to also do kudos to Matt's team because they came in and implemented uh, teams for us because we knew we needed more collaboration, and we just started with teams in January. That teams, Slack, whatever it is that gives you that, hey, you have a second, or I've got a quick question. It, it allows you to do that pop in the office and get that question answered so they can continue the work, okay? And there are a couple of times when they that pop in the office happens, in this case on Teams, and then you just pick up the, again, the Teams you call them, and you have the conversation. 
with or without video, okay? Um, it's that collaboration that you're looking for. Also, one of the things we did was we started an employee who was full time, but we didn't have enough work for her because we had somebody that buddy system, you're not gonna buddy system 24 hours or even eight hours on a Zoom call or Teams, right? That person's going all over the place. They've got other meetings that the other person may not be involved in. So what we did was actually started this person with a couple of hours every couple of days. Okay, so two hours the first week per day, then to four hours. And it worked out that she had some vacation plan and things like that. And it was wonderful because she was not inundated with everything. And then we did give her the videos, Pam, to your point of learning about teams, about the software that we're using, about all of these other things that she was able to study on her own and because again, she used totally different things at a prior job and she'd only been at her company for two years. So wasn't quite 22, but close enough. So yeah. I, I think I agree with all of that. I think that's really good stuff. Um, the, um, the issue though, for me is I have to recognize uh, just addressing Sam or maybe continuing uh, that there are some things we're just not gonna be able to do. And identifying those things and understanding those weaknesses is really important. So the, that trust level, that interpersonal connection that comes from an in-person face-to-face relationship uh, is always going to be missing. And as a result, there are interpersonal skills that are going to be hard to develop in young people and anybody, even people who are uh, even people who have been on this uh, remote thing for, for many years. Those interpersonal skills begin to degrade. So in terms of doing interviews in the future or in terms of being able to reach out to folks and collaborate or to do sales or whatever, it, it is definitely an issue uh, where there's a, there's a weak spot, a hole. And we've tried at our company, we've tried to have online water coolers and parties and things like that, but it really does not do the same thing as in person. So what we're thinking about now is trying to create in-person opportunities for the teams in the company uh, to get together and to spend time together, especially for managers and employees, so that that level of human connection can be uh, firmed up and, and established. I think there's no doubt that in person, there's there's a flavor of in person that will never be able to be replicated unless you're in person. Um, but I think, I, I mean, for me personally, and I, I'm going to guess for those of you who either work completely remotely now or have over the last few years, there are techniques that can be employed that you can teach your managers to build up that trust, even if I never see the employee or the person that I'm working with face to face. So it's, it's a, it's leveraging to get to the same outcome, you're just leveraging a different set of skill sets, but mm -hmm. it's, you, it, it is entirely possible, I believe, to build a really strong trusting relationship and a really strong team, even if you never see each other in person, face to face. It's, again, it requires some intentionality and it requires a slightly different way, a slightly different set of expectations about how you're going to get there. But I personally believe that it is entirely possible in person always being better for sure. By the way, Pam, with, yep. uh, with, pardon me, Morris, by the way, with regard to that intentionality, one of the things as we scale these two businesses and put them together, I'm getting ready to hire a manager, um, an experienced person who I've known for many, many years. I hired him in a previous role. Um, and I, I'm really discarding the use of titles manager. My, my objective is to make him, uh, as I call it, head coach. And we began to replace the process of managing with the process of coaching, which is arguably a softer skill set, but substantially different in its expectation. So you used the word, Pam, intentionality. The whole idea is to be intentional with regard to uh, how we uh, have that person, the head coach, the manager, uh, basically work with people. So that's, that's one of the changes as I get ready to, to do that in the next month or so yep. uh, to do. So I'm sorry, Morris, go ahead. No, I, I'm fine. I actually, I thought uh, to hear from Chris, maybe uh, from a sales perspective, it seems like sales has often and always been semi-remote, <laughs> um, not to insult that personality, but the, the, you know, the way that sales folks manage 
uh, I think is, is slightly different. It's hard to manage by walking around when you can't walk around. So uh, I was hoping for perspective. I, I, I appreciate you throwing over. It, it, you're right, sales is always a bit of remote management. It always has been with an effective team. Um, you know, and, and Sam, I want to challenge a little bit, and this ties into Morris's question. At the end of the day, I've always approached sales leadership should be coaching first. Um, that's how you develop good teams in general. Um, I think the onus, I think there's a couple of things in play. I think my experience has been as everything is becoming more and more remote, the onus is on leadership to really have a structure in place, both out to the team as well as organically, where you're checking in and you're keeping in touch. You can, and gener there's a generational difference here too, but we can no longer expect that whatever the sales rep or the AE to come into the office and say, hey, I have this, I have that. At the end of the day, there tends to be ego within the sales environment and they try to stumble along a bit towards themselves. So we need to be more engaged from a leadership perspective. That's how I believe that works and carries forward. And that does require daily check-ins organically, not in a overbearing sort of way that does require structured weekly effective meetings, not ones that go on for an hour and a half, but a defined agenda and work it through. Um, and I think we also need, because I'm on, I'm, I, uh, there's, there's hair product here, but there's gray here. Um, we need to kind of flip it and realize that interpersonal as collectively, most of us on this call look at the water cooler conversations. For the most part, they're gone but also the generation behind us, interpersonal is this. Interpersonal is a gaming environment. Interpersonal is this right here. And it's def definitely, it's awkward for me as well. I grew up talking about Seinfeld around the water cooler. That was it, talking about Lost. But it's changed. And adjusting our train of thought and adjusting our management skills, bringing it forward is really how to engage. Because if you try to A, really hold down the millennials to we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this, it's not going to work. But so you balance the two out and you have to stay more on top of your sales team, but in a way that's not demonstrative. And that is a bit of coaching that comes into it and a bit of um, learning best practices. Hope that helps a bit more. Okay. That's really good. I think Mark's got a question or comment. Yeah, on this, on this question, thanks Morris. On this question of, of engaging employees, one of the best practices that I've read about is to send periodically send small things to them to, to drive engagement and send a message that's your important example, you know, a dozen cookies, example, a pound of coffee and a, and a coffee mug. Um, and I've read research where that's very, very effective in, in sending the message you're important and kind of replacing the, the, um, the bonding that, that is missing in face to face. And in fact, uh, I've seen it work very effectively in the company where my daughter works. She goes crazy when little little gifts, little unexpected gifts, uh, modest uh, arrive in the mail. So I think that's the best practice. And now I have, um, and I was wondering, do people have with those who are managing remote, uh, well, I think we all do now, um, monthly, and I think Chris, you said it with structured meetings, right? Because do you have, in the past, there were, you know, in my corporate environment, they were quarterly town halls type of deal. Uh, do people have those as well, or monthly staff meetings, or monthly, you know, team meetings, or, you know, to engage everyone a little bit more as well? From, 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 a, from a sales perspective, when I work into engagements, I do put into place a weekly meeting. Always has been previously in person, but now it is you do a weekly Zoom, WebEx, whatever, whatever your system is. From a sales perspective, you, I, you have to gather that team. You have to coach that team. You have to mentor that team as a group collectively at least once a week. That's been what's been successful for me previously and it's for my clients as well. Okay. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. We've we've had a weekly meeting for a long time. It's much more important now. So the team can hear is what you hear what each other's doing. But what I found is, is the weekly meeting does not satisfy the emotional need. So I also have weekly one-on-ones with each team member to get a holistic view of what's going on in their life. Because sharing that in front of the whole team is usually not appropriate. So it takes a lot of time. It's 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 intentional, but the regular cadence I find gives the the members of the team a sense of comfort that they're being looked after, they're being cared for, and that their work is valuable and what they're doing is on target. I like that. We, uh, 
Um, the um, there's a gentleman who's joined us. Uh, uh, Radu is a gentleman that I, I'm working with currently um, with a company that is the international uh, client that I mentioned, and it's very interesting. In this case, uh, Radu is in Romania, um, and uh, so first of all, time zone, right? It's uh, four or five in the afternoon. I'm trying to do the math in my head for Radu, and often we are on calls at either 6 a.m. my time or 10 p.m. his time. And so an understanding of that, I think, is real important. But one of the things that he and I uh, have done, and I think it's valuable, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to do, but it's towards that collaboration and innovation point, Pam, is um, if you're scripting everything or structuring every meeting, then that's not the same as getting together and arguing <laughs> or <laughs> discussing, right? And, and I think that's where, in, in this project that we're working on, sometimes I think we struggle. We've got so much going on, and we're constantly in touch, but do we ever brainstorm? Do we ever get a chance to kind of just, you know, what is it, chew the fat or whatever? And yeah, we've met each other from a perspective of, you know, hey, where are you going on vacation and some of that emotional kind of conversation. But I'm wondering the innovation piece, Pam, you know, how do we drive to that when you're um, and, and one of the folks in, in, on our team actually co-opted, uh, co stole a meeting. Uh, one time where we had an agenda and she basically said, listen, I know there's an agenda, but I just feel like we need to talk through some things uh, and, and figure some things out. And at the end of the meeting, she did say to me, I appreciate you sort of being quiet and, you know, leaving the agenda um, because I feel better. I feel emotionally somewhat better about signing off on something or figuring out, you know, what's our next step or just socializing the team to one point of view. So, you know, Pam, I was wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, when I talk about intentionality, that in, it includes being intentional about how do you have those kinds of conversations. And so not every meeting do I think needs to have a formal agenda. Sometimes the meeting topic is let's brainstorm these things or these three risks or challenges have come up. Let's talk about how we're resolving them. It doesn't have to have, a. I don't believe every meeting has to have a formal agenda so, because organically you need to have space and allow for space for those kinds of conversations to come up. And so I really appreciate, Maura said in the example that you gave, you recognized that that was something that people needed time and space for. So you sort of pivoted from what was supposed to be the agenda to allow for that to happen. Um, you know, I, I think the big word that comes out of COVID from a work perspective is flexibility. And I think a lot of organizations apply flexibility to what does that mean to, am I in the office? Do I have a hybrid work model? What are my working hours, et cetera? But there's also flexibility in the way that we work and sort of challenging the status quo about what that looks like. So in the, the example that you gave, just having flexibility and we can pivot an agenda if we need to. Um, and I think, uh, Amy, something you mentioned that I that sort of goes to what Morris was just asking is, I almost, or not almost, I believe that, um, in this current environment that we're all working and living in, um, you cannot communicate enough. And so if you were doing a quarterly staff meeting or a monthly staff meeting, you may need to think about doing them more often because you're losing that impromptu organic communications that was happening. So you may need to rethink the infrastructure about how you're communicating information or how your organization is communicating it I've seen organizations going now to doing weekly newsletters to make sure that their employees are kept up to date. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Um, but again, it all requires us to think about and to sort of challenge the status quo on how we've done things in the past. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to touch on with, which is something Chris mentioned, is you also need to give space to celebrate successes and be in, again, be intentional about celebrating the successes in a previous organization that I worked in, every time we closed a new deal, somebody rang a bell and that, which was awesome. And that made sense when we were in one, one floor of an office building. But as we started to expand and we had offices in different parts of the country, or we were on more than one floor in a building. Thank you, Amy. You're my job. Yeah. That bringing a bell, bringing an actual bell didn't make, it made sense for the people who were in the office where the bell was being rung but it wasn't a scalable way of celebrating successes. So we needed to come up with other ways to make sure that everybody in the company knew that we had closed a new deal or signed a new deal and had some level of excitement about it. 
Um, and so I don't particularly think that that organization did a great job of it, but it's just, a, you have to think about these things from a scalability perspective. So also Chris, to your point, just allowing time for, um, for celebrations. There's a few tools out there like Kudo boards that will allow you to set this up. You can do it for virtual birthday cards. So again, you know, people aren't all in the office, nobody's signing an actual birthday card. So there's technology out there like a kudos board where you can set up a virtual birthday card, give access to everybody on the team to be able to post their message, video, meme, whatever. And then on the person's birthday, send them the link to the virtual birthday card. Um, and so it doesn't replace the physical birthday card in the same kind of way, but it's not that you're ignoring somebody's birthday altogether. So it's not one or the other. There's some and solution in the middle, I think. That's a great, great comment, thank you. Um, Newell's got a hand raised. I'm sorry. Yeah, who did? Newell. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. yeah, if I could just, I, I just want to respond or, 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 or kind of tie together several points that I've heard people make. And, and to me, they are sort of integrated here. We, we keep hitting at different aspects of remote workers that I think, I think tie together. One is large meetings versus small discussions. And to the point that several people have made, when you have a large meeting, uh, you get relatively shallow commentary from people. And it's what, it's, a, it's what I would call single point communications. Okay, I have one point to make, I get my 30 seconds, I make my one point. And now we move on and five people later, somebody finally gets an opportunity to reply to that one point and you have to mentally connect that in your head. And that's really stressful. So, and it goes to a conversation we've had about a couple of other uh, beacon events. Should we have more? Should we have less people, et cetera? It all depends on what you're after. If you're looking for a brainstorming session where you want 50 points to be brought out, by all means, have a bunch of people. But if you want meaningful conversation about something, and that's what I'm calling contextual as compared to single point communications, you need much smaller groups where as soon as somebody says something, I can jump in and offer my comment to reply. The other, the other thing I would, I would stress is we, we as, as, a, as a business community worldwide tend to be pretty reactive to things. So we're all boppity bopping along, working on site, we're having meetings, we're walking to people's offices, and there's been zero thought for too many years in too many businesses about what happens when Tommy and Susie can't make it into the office today, okay? And we don't think about that. And then we're all remote, or a lot of us are remote, and now all we're thinking about is, well, how do we work together when we're remote? And now we're starting to bring people back into offices, and now we're starting to think about, oh, how do we let people that are remote work with people that are in the office? And I'm not pointing fingers at the folks in this group. I think we're kind of an exceptional group of people, but that's the way most businesses have worked through this. Let me react to my current situation. The long-term strategy, and I think probably for many of us on this call, the right answer is try to develop the same means of working together when we're in the office face-to-face -face that are gonna facilitate when we're not all face-to-face, -face, us still working together and whatever that may be. And my final point is, you know, we rely an awful lot and we talk an awful lot about remote work and collaboration being done by video. And video, in my opinion, is about 2% of the collaborative work that we need to do together. And, and video meetings tend to promote the single point communications and make the contextual stuff a little bit more difficult unless you're down to two people, right? So I think sometimes we get really wrapped up on video when there's a lot of other ways we can share information in a relatively free form format. I'm done. 
Thanks. Thank you, Newell. And well, I, I also say, think to your to your point about video, I think a lot of people are burnt out on being on the video. I don't know about you guys, but I'm kind of tired of looking at myself. Um, but beyond that, depending upon the organization you work for, there's a lot of there's more research coming out about um, unconscious bias and biases because of video. And a lot of employees who maybe live in um, lower income neighborhoods or in how maybe they're living with a number of people in their house and or, or whatever their personal situation actually don't want to be in video because they don't want people to see what their backgrounds look like and and or there's not a quiet place for them to work. And so I think cont to your point about context, the context for the individual and why they may or may not want to be on camera all the time or ever is also super important to think about when you're thinking about how do you engage your employees and um, make sure that your employees are feeling motivated and valued and respected. And so there's a lot about being on video um, that I think has some unintentional consequences, both positively and negatively um, as well, that we should consider as we think about sort of the new work environment. Yeah, and that was my question coming into the meeting, Newell, and I'll just put it on the table and shut up, but the, I also do pastoral work, and so everything now is hybrid, hybrid, and what I find is we're creating two groups, the online group and the in-person group, uh, and they have a very difficult time connecting with one another because the in-person group is using interpersonal connections and the online, and I, I, it's a puzzle. I can't, it's hard for me to figure out how to not allow that kind of a separation happened between the two groups. Uh, and I've, I've been really uh, frustrated with that. And then that brings me to a couple of points. And Mark, I see your hand raised, but I just want to make, uh, I want to go on a, keep your hand raised, but we're just going to go to another question, which is um, what does hybrid mean to the organization? Okay. And, you know, Pam, I'd like you to talk about this one because Hybrid means different things to different organizations. They can embrace it. They can say, these are exactly what you're gonna do. That can be very flexible. Um, and before I have you do that, I also wanna yes. say, I think you use unconscious bias, Pam, in your words. And Zoe, we have a beacon thing on unconscious bias this, this afternoon, right? Yeah, it's... Um... So far, we had just invited the MAC members, but Mac uh, members. Karen Spencer Kelly is going to give a unconscious bias training for some of our Beacon leaders. Yeah. So it's very appropriate that you brought that up, Pam, because it happens to everyone. Okay. And I no, think no surprise that I sit on the Beacon Diversity Committee. Yeah. And so, okay. Do you want to talk yep. though about hybrid in an organization? What does it mean? I mean, how does a company decide that? How do they get flexible to do that? How do they take into consideration all of Newell's and even John's points? Yep. Um, so I think the first thing is that there's no one answer and that all of us are sort of living and trying to make these decisions, particularly if you're part of the HR finance IT organization without any precedent before you. And so I think it is very helpful to hear what other organizations are doing. But in the end, I think every organization needs to make the right decision for them based on the industry that they're in, based on where their workforce is located, um, based on the market conditions of where they're located and where they're recruiting from. There's a lot of different factors that go into, but there's no one right answer for this. Um, and I and think also to Sam's point, the generation, the workers. Absolutely. Yeah. Although interestingly enough, my experience generally, generationally is that we assume that early talents don't want to be in the office or would prefer to work in this environment. My experience having worked with interns and early talents in the past is actually they prefer to be in the office and they don't always know how to make the connections when they're not in person. And so while a lot of their social interaction with the people that they know takes place online and in a virtual kind of world, all of their, all of their schooling and everything that school has trained them to do has always been in person. Mm -hmm. And so my experience is that actually early talents would much prefer to be in person with their colleagues than be virtual with their colleagues. So I think it's a, um, I think it's a little bit of, a, of, a, of a, an assumption that we make about that early talents would prefer to work with or are 
uh, adapt easier to working in this kind of an environment than folks who have been in the workforce for longer. Um, but that's just my experience. Others may have different experiences. So when it comes to defining hybrid, the first thing you need to define is what does hybrid mean for you? Mm -hmm. And so for some organizations, I see hybrid meaning um, individuals have a choice of whether or not they're working in the office or they're working from home. And then within that, organizations are defining what the process or the policies are around that. And then putting in place the tools to be able to administer that. So as an example, um, I have a client and work with somebody, they've decided that um, they want all of their employees to be in the office at some point during the week. And they've reduced their, their capacity within the office to um, accomplish and to abide by COVID restrictions, which means they've put into place a reservation system. And so every employee needs to go into the office at least once a week. In order to go into the office, you have to reserve your space. If I'm early in reserving my space, that means I get to go into the office on the day and the time that I want. If I'm late in reserving my space, that may mean that I go to the office at, on a day or a time that wasn't my first choice. But the requirement is that you have to be in the office at least once a week. That's their requirement. That's how they're defining hybrid. Um, other organizations are defining it by role. And so some roles have to be in the office because you can't do your work otherwise. Pharmaceutical companies that have labs or manufacturing companies, you can't manufacture something from your home. You have to be in the office to do that. Um, and so a hybrid for them is we're defining based on role and based on responsibility, who needs to be in the office and who has more flexibility to work from home or be in the office. And other organizations are saying um, that I've seen are saying in order to um, to minimize the risk that we talked about earlier about lower productivity from an innovation perspective, they're saying that they're gonna have intact teams come to the office on the same day. So if all of us were part of a team, we would agree we're gonna be in the office on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then we can work from home the other days, or we could come into the office if that's my preference. And so hybrid just means, I think a lot of different things for a lot of different people. I think it's important that um, as organizations are defining what that means for them, that they're obviously taking into consideration what makes the most sense for their culture and for the employee experience they wanna have and balancing that with, we still have to be a productive and a, and a profitable organization. And so how do we drive that? And then how do we scale that in a way that makes sense? But the long and the short of it is that if there was an easy answer to this, I, we would all be millionaires because we would have solved it by now and we would, would have sold that solution to every company out there. There's not an easy answer to this. I actually have one company that's dealing hybrid. They actually went to a six-day work week. And so they added a Saturday, a set of Saturday hours um, to their work week and employees can opt to be in the office on a Saturday um, because... Um, they're in a lab environment and that was the way that they could figure out early on to be able to make sure that everybody could be in the office for an amount of time. Um, but they're actually keeping the Saturday hours because it was really highly received by employees who said, if, um, if I could be off on a Wednesday and I don't have, and then my spouse and I are not trying to figure out how to juggle childcare and homeschooling and all of these things five days a week, and we need, only need to juggle that four days a week because I can be off on a Wednesday because I'm working on a Saturday, that's actually way better for my life and way more flexibility for my life than trying to fit my work into a five-day work week. And then we've got the vaccine, plus or minus, and how that is yep. all working, and do you fire the people? And I know Bank of America uh, required all of its employees to be, if you were vaccinated, you came into the office. If you were not vaccinated, they just put out a blanket statement, you stay home. Well, I know a couple of employees there who stayed home even though they were vaccinated. And it's like, oh, you know, anyway. Um, and I'm guessing you we'll mean the, that and I'm too. guessing the reverse was true as well. My guess is that there were some vaccinated employees, unless there was a way to control that with badging or something. I'm guessing there were some unvaccinated employees who also made their way into the office. Um, yeah. And again, it's so. one of those, that's a whole nother, like you said, flexibility, sure. flexibility is really required here. And uh, John says, our company still will not require an office appearance. Yep. Um, and that's, it's again, how some can, some some will, some won't. We're hearing it in the news all over the place, of airlines and, and uh, everything else. So, and that goes back to some companies, we're talking professional services here. So we 
have that option, but some of um, the companies, like if you're on an, in an airline, well, if your job requires you to be on the plane, you know, that's in the office. So mm -hmm. a lot of other things going on there. Mark, I want to get back to you because you had your hand raised. Yeah, a couple of points on video. One of the lessons that I learned a long time ago is that video is pretty good at maintaining relationships. What it's not good at is starting relationships. So I think a best practice would be if you're trying to start a relationship with a new employee or a new client, the initial, the initial meeting should be face-to-face -face, and then you can maintain it pretty effectively over video. I think that'll go a long way. Um, another I'm point, gonna and this, I'm gonna sorry? disagree with that, Mark. I'm gonna disagree with that. Okay. Almost everyone I've met in my almost 10 years of being in business, has been on video and I've, and, or on a phone call. I've met a lot of people through in person, but I just got a client the other day that was referred to me and we're doing business and it's a large client and actually our video didn't work. So we, I signed it just on the phone. So you've established relationships both ways in person and video, which did you find more satisfactory? I personally, I have no problem with the video. Okay. Yeah. I think it's because I started that way and just that's the way I operate. And there are clients who cannot operate that way. And that's okay too. And yeah. 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 So I think yeah. one just has to be flexible. Anecdotally for me, uh, all the folks who I've managed only by video tend to be the ones that I have the most difficulty retaining. There you go. That's mm -hmm. a to Mark's point. Yeah, I, I worked with a major Fortune 25 company and half of our staff were always remote. And at that point there was very little um, video available. Yeah. Yeah. One other, one other quick point, Amy, and John mentioned this uh, uh, quite a while ago about having weekly one-on-ones. Um, I think that that, that is a, another best practice. And one of the reasons is that it helps you understand an employee's uh, specific circumstances. You know, my experience with video is, is very easy. My kids are grown, but my experience is going to be very different than somebody who's got three kids under five at home or aging parents at home or somebody who doesn't want, for whatever reason, to, to show part of their home. So I think I think one-on-ones weekly like that will help uh, uncover and help you manage um, problems related to some of these other things. Yeah. Mark, two, th two additional thoughts on the one-on-one. -on -one. I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's one of the, um, it potentially is one of the most underutilized tools that a manager has to building engagement and trust and all of the things that we've been talking about today. Um, uh, my experience is that if you give ownership of the one-to-one -to, -one to your employees, particularly over the last 18 months, you actually get more out of them than if you're the oh one God. driving the yeah. agenda, right? Because mm -hmm. they feel like they have some control and agency in a world where they feel like they have no control and agency right now, um, given everything that's going on. Um, I'm also a big fan of, unless there's a reason why we have to be on video for the one-on-one, -on -one, oh, replicating a walk and talk is a great way to do one-on-ones where actually you're both, you're either on the phone or even better, both of you are outside actually walking and physically moving around while you're talking. So if there's not a reason to be on video, maybe video is not the right thing, but you need to set that expectation up front so people know, is this call going to be video or not? That's the other thing I would say about the hybrid world is making sure that it's really clear in the meeting invite. You're expected to be on video. You're not expected to be on video, whatever the situation is. Um, That's good. That's good. Yeah. And then the other thing I wanted to say um, related to what you were saying is I also think there's a lot more grace and almost humanity that we all have for each other and our personal circumstances because of the way that we've been working. So I know, you know, three, five, 10 years ago when I worked in a really remote, you would get really embarrassed or stressed out and others would be irritated if your dog was barking or the doorbell was ringing or a baby was crying in the background. Now I see people like holding their kids on their laps while they're having a conversation and everybody sort of is okay with that. And so I feel like there's, um, there's almost more humanity, empathy in the world today um, in allowing people to sort of share more of what their life is like because of the way we've been working over the last two years or so. 
I Just think the, the uh, ones. Sorry, Tamara. Yeah. I'm sorry, John. Go ahead. I said, just going back to one-on-ones, I don't know who works for you guys, but I have a number of people who struggle with mental illness uh, working for me. Uh, and I found that the online only uh, requires a lot more contact to keep people from getting anxious or being anxious. The way you read an online, the way you read an email, the way you read a chat it can sometimes be very, very much different than the way it was given. So it requires a lot more deliberate, for my, my anxiety folks, it requires a lot more deliberate uh, points of contact with them, uh, which is over the last uh, couple of years, especially has been even more difficult because everything that's going on in the world is making them even more anxious. So th this is another problem. I sort of was hoping to hear other, other possible solutions for this other than you know, flying out to California to, to sit with them for a couple of days. But uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's definitely an issue for me uh, dealing with people's uh, internal struggles. And I, and, and I think, Pam, just, I just want to agree with you it, re, it has sort of brought out, there's a, there's a plus and minus, right? It's sort of brought out a close, a, a sense of closeness, which wasn't there before uh, because the need uh, presents much more significantly. I think the, um, the, the point that you're making, and, and I see it in the chat and totally it's uh, to Mark's uh, uh, business, is um, personality matters or, you know, lack of personality. I don't know. But your type of personality and, and any insight that we can get into that, like the Myers-Briggs or uh, personality index, you know, I think that's, there's a real interesting perspective from that. And I, you know, um, in, in one, and then I'll turn it over to you, Mark, but one thing uh, that I found interesting lately is, for example, I was on a first meeting with someone, um, we have met, had already met with sort of the trusted advisor of this person. Uh, but we were meeting with this potential client for the first time. And the three of uh, my partner and, and this other uh, gentleman, trusted advisor, we were on video, but the new person did not show her video. And after we got off the call, my partner and I said to each other, that was rude. That was, we felt as if here we were, you know, being transparent, showing you the picture of, uh, you know, Pavarotti or uh, the Eiffel Tower. But um, in, our, in our case, did we really meet this person? Were they paying attention when we were speaking to them? All of those visual cues, Pam, that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and can you really sort of learn enough about the person from a personality perspective if all you get is that disembodied voice? And I'll give it back to you, Mark. But I did think that we have come up as a group now with two t-shirts. One says intentionally spontaneous, and the other one says flexible structure. Hmm. Mark. Yeah, um, uh, uh, personality assessment tools like Predictive Index and, and others, there are others on the market, I'm biased obviously towards Predictive Index, really can help give you insight into uh, an employee's drives. For example, uh, are they really, really extroverted? For example, are they really, really team oriented? And people who are like that are gonna struggle in an environment like this versus people who are more independent uh, and who are more introverted. So personality assessments can give you some insight into how to manage, into how to manage your people uh, individually. So, um, and I've, I've got several articles on that. If anybody's interested, you can reach out to me. I'm happy to share the articles. There's another piece that I've seen with uh, some of the, you know, testing is around where you do sort of a group think on the personality of a position, which is sort of fascinating to me that, okay, what do people think? It, it's from, you know, kind of an HR perspective. What are the requirements for this job? We're going to recruit for this. So what are the requirements? Yeah, you need a degree, you need 10 years, whatever it is. But now you take it to the next step to kind of go, well, this person needs to be a people person. What the hell does that mean? If you can define those pieces, you know, for that role, detail-oriented, but still communicative or communicative, is that a disease? No, it's still able to communicate. But, you know, things like that, I, I think are really interesting. Of course, it takes time and money, but there is a real place here for when it matters 
how you're filling that spot and who's going into that spot and what's their style and now what's the personalities of the team and how does that personality interact with what you've defined as that management personality is some really interesting kind of feedback. And I think it, it depends on when you look at it at a macro view in a huge company, sort of too much data. But on the other hand, when you're maybe a small organization and you're trying to figure some of this nuance out, and it really matters because you don't have that many employees, so you know you don't want to lose a good one, you don't want to hire the wrong one. You know maybe that's where there's some value, uh, and I've seen that you know seen that value in certain organizations. I have one other quick point: is the no video versus video. Is it a generational thing? I don't know, but I do find in most recent clients, younger folks, not always, but younger people don't jump on video right away in a Zoom call? Um, or is it kind of a size thing? Or if you're speaking thing? If I'm in a, in a chat like that, you know, a conversation like this, a lot of times with a client, no one shows their video. And then maybe if you are the one who's presenting, you show your video. But I just sort of throw that out there. It's a video etiquette. It's another t-shirt. I think that, and I think we've um, talked about that. Again, I think that goes to the organization and what do they require? Um, I know a person who just recently switched jobs in the younger generation and in the old position, most people did not do video. And that company had older people. She went to the new company, young, uh, biotech, et cetera. And it was a requirement that if you're on a video, unless you have computer issues, you know, internet bandwidth, et cetera, you are on video. And it, because if you're in a meeting in person, you're there physically. So what's the difference, you know? So again, and I can see it if somebody's presenting, like you said, if someone's presenting, you want to present that, that's what you want to focus on, not who's playing with the hair or whose kid is in the background and things like that. And I can see that being done again, also from a um, bandwidth perspective, but I think it goes back to the organization and do they have rules to you? And I love your flexible structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing, Amy is, and I personally, I don't think it is a generational thing. I mm -hmm. think it's an expectation thing. And so I think as organizations think about hybrid workforce, putting in place guidelines or expectations around video, no video, video at the beginning, and then you can drop off a of video. You know, when do you have to be on video when you don't have to be on video, just like organizations are having to define expectations for things that they never thought that they would have to define expectations for. This is another one um, where, again, it's organizational and bringing us sort of back to where we started with productivity is being on camera increasing productivity or de decreasing your productivity? Um, if really part of what I think organizations are struggling with is how do they ensure that productivity isn't decreasing in this new working environment? And so again, that's there's no right or wrong answer and there's no one answer for that. It's really um, based on the, um, on the uh, ecosystem within the organization that you're working or organizations that you're working with. Um, but being clear about what the expectation is, is important. I think. Yeah, but uh, l l let's not forget, you know, too many, too many of, too many companies, too many of us in business think about something. We think about one interaction and we make up a rule and go, it's yep. now the expectation. Not considering that we've got 50 or 100 people with different circumstances. And Pam, to go back to your earlier comment, you might have somebody who is, horribly embarrassed to mm -hmm. turn on their video camera. You might have another person who just doesn't have the tech mm -hmm. and their, their, their feed is going to be horrible anyway. Yep. You might have another person who's got all kinds of connectivity problems. You might have another person who's taking care of three kids and trying to participate in the meeting to the best of his or her ability. You got, you got a million circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I think, too many companies go, here's a set of rules. In order for us to pull this off, we're going to make up a set of rules. And it's a single leader or two or three leaders of the business who think about one scenario, mine, and make up a set of rules and expectations for everybody 
without any understanding of what that is doing to other people. Yeah. yeah. Let me add one more category. Folks like me who aren't photogenic. Uh, it's, it's kept me out of senior management for a long time. Uh, and I do feel sensitive to the fact that when I'm on a camera, I don't look nearly as good as when I'm in person. So, and my, my senior execs get mad at me when I'm not on uh, with them on video. Uh, I, I try to do it every now and then just to, to prove to them that I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not being a, uh, contrary. Uh, but I think really, from my point of view, you seeing my video in my head uh, decreases my effectiveness in communicating. Yeah. So, so are we then suggesting a third t-shirt to Mars, adaptable leadership is really what we're talking about here? Because um, I think we need to continually be mindful of the people we're working for in their environment. And as we work to adapt, I think that it, it, it falls on us as leaders within wherever we're sitting because a leader is someone who's working outside and it's always going to be one-on-one -on -one because they're stringing high power lines. That's always going to be face-to-face. -face. So we need to adapt as leaders within this environment. I'll throw that as a concept. Isn't that really what we're talking about? Yep, it is. Do, do you get – I hate to throw a, a, a theoretical question, but do you get to be a leader if you're adaptable? Or are leaders there because they push an agenda and, you know, they I rule think, with uh, an iron fist? I'll respond. I'll just from my point of view, I think a good leader is adaptable. I don't think, I think the days of ruling by an iron, I am, I am a fan of structure. Don't get me wrong. But I, uh, but it has to be adaptive. And I think coming up generationally, you need to be mindful of a bunch of things that we've heard here that are really interesting to me. But if you are just going to work within a framework of X, Y, or Z and be rigid within that framework, I, I don't see that personally as a recipe for success. Yeah. And I, I think, think it may be a, a product of culture. And yeah. leader, leadership really is, is a manifestation of the culture of the organization. In an entrepreneurial organization, see entrepreneurs' culture that's setting, uh, in effect, a standard. But in a large organization... <clears throat> such as the time I worked at DuPont, you know, we had the, almost that DuPont way that we did things. And if you didn't fit the DuPont way, thanks very much. Don't let the door hit you the way on, in the butt on the way out. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the nature of the culture. Uh, and, cult, you know, who was a Drucker said culture trumps strategy every day. And uh, he's exactly right. So what that leads us to in some way, and I posed the question earlier, are there a prescriptive set of principles like a Myers-Briggs or a, a DISC about success in a remote environment? I wonder if there's a prescriptive cultural norm that we can begin to ascertain that suggests success in a remote workplace or hybrid. And I would say, Sam, that that our current culture is driving towards a one-size-fits-all model. I mean, all indications are that we are thinking less about the individual and more about the corporate entity. Uh, and I think there was a study that came out just two weeks ago or so around this issue of top leadership in companies and uh, the connection between one-size-fits-all and, uh, and a worldview which is, which is really uh, self-focused, not externally focused. So it's interesting that being flexible and having that kind of leadership style, actually, I think it's, it's far better. Chris, I agree with you, far better style, but we're always being funneled into, um, into the, the one-size-fits-all model because a lot of us are functioning not just as operationals, but also as politicians. And as soon as we operate as a politician, it's much easier for us to manage by saying everybody's doing one thing than it is to manage you know, a million different things. So I think there is a happy medium somewhere where we have a policy interacting with individuality and the policy has to allow that flexibility. And I John, the, the, we, the interesting point, I think, I, on I that. To, yes, Sam, yes. we could go on probably for about six hours on these topics. <laughs> okay. I think we need to um, stop here, just kind of summarize because we are at uh, five minutes before the end of this. Like I said, I think we could continue these conversations and everyone is welcome to do so on another call. And whether you want it to be on a call, in an office, on a video, yeah, that's your choice. 
I think what we found is managing people just in this environment, we're going to have a hybrid workforce. And we're all going to be hybrid whether as we meet each other too. And I think a lot of that comes down to the words that Morris used, which I loved, intentionally spontaneous. I love that because it really is, you know, making sure you have that ability to do that water cool that we were used to, right? And then the flexible structure. And I think, Chris, you were the one who really said, you've got to have some structure in this to be able to get things done. So mm -hmm. it's just, um, I think those things, Pam and Morris, I want to just open it up to you two to say any last words. Pam? Morris. Uh, sure. So from my perspective, there is a little bit of technology. Oh, there's tons of technology that might help. But there's something um, that I've been looking at, uh, uh, objectives and key results, OKR, right? KPIs, OKR, M-O-U-S-E. But um, there's a couple of things um, around sort of specifying an overall arching kind of cultural goal in an organization and then the business pieces that make it up and then tying individuals three to five kind of measurable details to those goals, keeping it transparent, rotating it through levels of management using technology and then communicating it to the employee involved in that conversation and then the employee being able to put in, you know, how are they, that sort of uh, uh, updates, status updates into that the system kind of forces slash encourages you to have regular conversations around it um, and sort of tries to drive that kind of a structure where you can't manage by walking around, but you can sort of do it within this technology. So it's just one of the items that I know one of the questions that was asked was, hey, how do we, you know, are there tools out there that could help us this, this OKR me mentality? something that came out of Google and I just throw it out there. So, and thank you for the opportunity and the information. This was really cool. And we're going to get multiple t-shirts made. <laughs> Pam. I'll throw another t-shirt in there, which is organized chaos, which is, I feel like the environment that we're all living in these days. Um, from my side, just a big thank you. This was a super um, interactive and really engaging conversation. Uh, and so uh, I learned a bunch in this call, as well as I hope I shared uh, between Morris and I, that we shared good information with the group. Um, and I would just say um, thank you. And we're all doing really hard things these days in ways that we've never had to do them before. And some days we're going to get right and some days we're not. And tomorrow is a new day to try something different. Beacon is the premier executive networking organization serving the Mid-Atlantic region. To learn more, go to beaconforlife.org.